There's a monster black hole in our backyard, astronomically speaking. Life could survive underground on Mars for hundreds of millions of years. Starlink can work as a GPS and bad news for Arecibo. All this and more in this week's episode of Space Bites. Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years. Now this is our Space Bites, where we cover brief, bite-sized pieces of news about space and astronomy so that you can get just an overview of everything that is happening this week. All right, let's get into the news. The closest black hole ever discovered. We live in a big Milky Way, and there's a lot of stuff here. You know, there are 10 billion white dwarfs, 1 billion neutron stars, and kind of unnervingly, there are about 100 million stellar mass black holes. So not the supermassive black hole that's in the middle of the Milky Way, but the rest of the ones that all came from stars that died. So that means that there are black holes that are very close. But the challenge in observing black holes is that, of course, their gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape them. So how do you find them? Now, you can find black holes when they're in a binary system with another star, and they're called X-ray transients. What happens is you've got the black hole that is orbiting around this other star, and it's so close that the black hole is siphoning material off of the star and then burping out X-rays as it gobbles down parts of the star, like a vampire that's keeping its victim alive. But that's just a fraction. Like the fact that you're going to get a black hole really close to a star, that's not going to be the most common situation. You're mostly going to get like just a black hole that is apart from its star, just hanging out in space, attracting the star with its gravity, but not actually feeding actively. So astronomers looked through the Gaia database. Of course, you know, Gaia is like my favorite spacecraft. They looked at 200,000 stars. Specifically, they were looking at binary stars where you could see the stars moving backwards and forwards, side to side, because they were being orbited by some other star. In most of the cases, it's just like two stars orbiting around each other or three stars or five stars. And sometimes you get a star and a neutron star or a star and a white dwarf. But in one of these examples, the astronomers found a star that was orbiting nothing. And when they made some calculations, they were able to figure out that what it is, is it's a star that's orbiting a 12 mass stellar black hole. The kind of unnerving part is that it turns out that this is the closest black hole that's ever been seen. It's 1,500 light years away. Is that close? Is that far? It, it's far, right? Like, like the center of the Milky Way is 20 ish thousand light years away from us 1500 light years away from us is like, far away. So don't worry, it's not close, it's not going to impact us. But still, it's pretty cool that this technique of examining these binary stars turned out to contain a black hole. Again, Gaia delivers the goods. Life can hide deep within Mars. There are a lot of hardy life forms here on Earth. One of the hardiest is this bacteria called Deinococcus radiodurans. And it was actually first discovered when scientists were radiating cans of food, and they found that they were still getting bacteria inside that were taking off, even though it was like an extreme amount of radiation that they were hitting it with. And later on, they were able to identify this strain of bacteria, and they call it Deinococcus radiodurans, and the scientists have been studying it for decades. And it is incredibly hardy to radiation. And the reason it's hardy to radiation is because it can handle being dried out, it can handle being desiccated. And so you could take this bacteria, you could dry it out, and then you could have it sit on the shelf forever like literally billions of years, trillions of years, and then you could give it a little water, give it a little nutrients, and it's right back at it again. And it turns out just this mechanism that damages life from radiation is the same kind of mechanism that damages life when it dries out. And so this bacteria has developed a lot of tricks and techniques for being able to repair itself when it dries out. And these happen to be good for radiation. And a lot of other very extreme life forms like C. elegans, um, 
Of course, tardigrades, various forms of yeast are in this similar situation. They can handle extreme levels of radiation. They can handle being dried out and they seem like they're like the perfect kinds of life forms for being able to go to Mars. And so researchers exposed this Deinococcus radio Durans to the level of radiation you would experience inside Mars. So not on the surface, like if you're on the surface, you're exposed to ultraviolet radiation, the bacteria is gone within hours, not down in the soil a little bit, because then you're exposed to the cosmic radiation and solar rays, and that is still very deadly. But once you're down a few meters into the regolith on Mars, you're protected from all this exterior radiation. And the only radiation that is impacting you is the background radiation from the interior of Mars itself. And according to their research, they found that this bacteria can survive in that background radiation for about 280 million years before it gives up the ghost from all of that radiation, which is kind of amazing when you think about it, like that there could be life hiding under the soil on Mars that's been there for hundreds of millions of years, just waiting for warmth, food, water to pop right back. We need a sample from Mars. Now, could life have gotten started on Mars? Maybe. We know that life on Earth started literally the moment the planet had cooled down to the point that liquid water could form on the surface of Earth. But all this time, Mars was probably a warmer, wetter world. Now, the sun was about 30% dimmer than it is today, about 4.5 billion years. Earth was a molten ball of rock getting pummeled by Mars sized objects, creating the moon. It was not a good place to live. Mars was farther away, cooler, smaller, and probably had oceans covering the surface. It had an atmosphere. It had a magnetosphere. So how do scientists know that Mars used to be like this? Well, they were able to examine samples of Mars that we have here on Earth in the form of Mars meteorites. They were able to crack open these meteorites, find the gases inside and then measure the ratios of different kinds of hydrogen. And what they found was that back about four and a half billion years, the atmosphere of Mars was very rich in hydrogen. And hydrogen is actually a very potent greenhouse gas. And so back in the early Mars history, even though the sun was dimmer, the atmosphere was filled with hydrogen, the hydrogen trapped the heat and that made the planet warm. But maybe it wasn't quite warm enough so that life could have thrived. In fact, life might have wiped out life on Mars. Let me explain. So I mentioned over 4 billion years ago, the surface of Mars was warm, but it wasn't like tropical warm, it was not frozen warm. And so it's possible, we have no evidence of this yet, but it's possible that there were life forms similar to the kinds of life forms that we have here on Earth called methanogens. These would be living just under the surface of the planet, they would be consuming heat, chemicals, producing methane as a byproduct. But as this methane built up in the atmosphere of Mars, it's toxic and poisonous to other life forms that attempt to live out on the surface of Mars. And so life couldn't spread out onto the wider surface. And then as the planet lost its thicker atmosphere cooled down, it was like the death blow for life there. So it's kind of ironic that you get life and as a byproduct of life, it is producing less efficient greenhouse gases, it's destroying the greenhouse effect on the planet and it allows the planet to cool down so that it wipes out the life. We have an example of this actually here on Earth. There is a time back early on in Earth's history called the oxygen catastrophe. And what happened was this new life form cyanobacteria got going on the planet, it was able to very efficiently turn sunlight into more cyanobacteria and it produced oxygen as a byproduct. And that oxygen filled the atmosphere and the life currently was not ready to handle that oxygen. And it wiped out a lot of species until we got things that could actually tolerate the oxygen and then life was able to bounce back. But because Mars is farther, smaller, cooler, maybe was losing its atmosphere, it just didn't get that chance to bounce back. Starlink could be a GPS alternative. 
Starlink has the largest satellite network that's ever been built. There's about 3000 of these satellites flying overhead. They are delivering high speed internet to people on the ground, including me for like two more weeks, and then I get fiber. But did you know that these Starlinks could actually be used as a rudimentary GPS system? Scientists at the University of Texas, Austin, were able to scan the signals coming from the Starlink satellites and partially decode them. The positions of the satellites are known, but what the key is that they send out timing bits. And by decoding the timing bits, they're able to then reverse engineer where the location was on Earth compared to those satellites. It's kind of similar to how you can use your Wi Fi network or you can use nearby cell phone towers to help you figure out where your location is on Earth, even when you don't have access to the GPS system. They were able to use a Starlink terminal, they had to be close to a Starlink terminal to be able to get that position, but they were able to get it down to about 30 meters accuracy. And what I love about this is they didn't ask for permission, they just did it. And they didn't even have to be able to fully decode the information that's coming out of the Starlinks, just some of the information that is associated with the signals. They could do much better if Starlink was willing to open up their protocol, provide GPS data. You could imagine an entirely new navigation system could be released across planet Earth. But still, it's pretty cool that you can hack a satellite network and use it as a GPS system even though it was never intended for that purpose. If you like what we do, why don't you consider joining our Patreon? This is our incredible community of supporters who provide us revenue every month to hire the staff to do the work that we do. We have writers at university today, video editors, audio producers, and it all is a bunch of salaries that I have to pay. So if you want to help me pay their salaries, go to patreon.com slash universe today. If you join, I will remove all the ads from the universe today website for life, you'll get advanced access to the videos that we do behind the scenes and lots of other goodies. So patreon.com slash universe today, Lucy takes a picture of the earth and the moon. NASA's Lucy mission is on its way out to the Trojan asteroid belt. But before it makes that journey, it has to make a couple of gravitational assist flybys of Earth to help change its direction and put it on the right trajectory to actually get out to the asteroid belt. So just this week, Lucy flew past the Earth and took a picture of our planet and the moon. And what's cool is you get this one picture that contains both the Earth and the moon and you can see the distance between them. This picture was taken when Lucy was 620,000 kilometers from the Earth, it got even closer to the moon. And in fact, the pictures of the moon are really good. They got within 260,000 kilometers of the moon. And like, just check out the quality of these pictures. And think about this, that when it arrives in the asteroid belt, when it arrives at the Trojan belt, it's going to be taking pictures from just a few hundred kilometers altitude away from these asteroids. And this is the quality of the pictures of the moon. It's like a good practice run. Of course, you know, you don't really think about how far away the Earth and the moon really are. But when you see this one picture, and they're both in there. I mean, the that classic thing is that you could fit all of the planets in the solar system between the Earth and the moon with a little room to spare. It's farther than you think. So Lucy has done its first gravitational assist of the Earth, it's got another gravitational assist coming up next year, and then it is off, it's going to fly through the asteroid belt and out to one of Jupiter's Trojan regions, then come back do another flyby of Earth, and then out to the other Trojan region. So there's going to be a lot of cool news over the coming years. A star blasted away the atmosphere from an exoplanet. Red dwarfs are the most common types of main sequence stars in the universe, they are smaller than the sun, they are fully convective, which means that they are able to mix all of their hydrogen throughout the entire star, they use much less fuel, and they last for a lot longer while the sun is only expected to last say, 10 billion years total. These red dwarf stars can live for a trillion years, 
10 trillion years. So they seem like ideal places that you could set up shop have life around these stars for a long time. The problem is these stars are volatile. In the first billion years of their lives, they can release these catastrophic flares that are like 100,000 times more powerful than the most powerful flare that the sun can release. And then of course, when you think about it, right, these red dwarf stars, their habitable zone is a lot smaller. And so you've got to have the planets huddled up close to the star to get enough warmth. And then you've got these monster killer flares that are blasting out. And so one of the big questions that astronomers have is, are these places habitable at all? Is there any chance that a planet can survive being close to one of these stars? Well, clearly not always because astronomers have found an example of a planet that is very close to the star. It orbits about every 12 hours. And the super flares coming off the star have completely scoured the atmosphere off of this planet, essentially turning it into a lifeless rock. So that's too close. But like all hope isn't lost. If the planet is a little farther away, if the planet has a very powerful magnetosphere like the Earth does, maybe it can survive. And of course, the good news is that if it can survive through that turbulent early period, then it could last for trillions of years in peace and safety, and a good long time for life to really evolve. So we don't know yet. We're in the middle of this search and over the coming decades as as we know of 1000s of these stars and planets, 10s of 1000s, hundreds of 1000s millions, we'll start to get a really good sense on whether or not these places are habitable or whether we should just give up and then just focus on the sun like stars as opposed to these red dwarfs. Arecibo won't be rebuilt. The Arecibo Observatory is this was this incredible observatory in Puerto Rico. And you probably are familiar with it. Like was it GoldenEye? Uh, there's various video games. I think there's like a Call of Duty in it. No. Battlefield. Call of Duty? Anyway. Um, it's famous in movies, famous in TVs. And of course, classically, when you think about contact, they're at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. And in 2020, the telescope collapsed and the damage was catastrophic. And we've been hoping against all hope that the National Science Foundation would repair the telescope. But we got the word this week that the answer is no, they're not going to repair it. They're going to put their efforts into other projects. So they are going to build a science center there, but like there's no science being done at Arecibo anymore. So it's more like a place to tell ghost stories. Anyway, I'm sad. I'm, I'm a little salty about this. Now you've still got the Chinese 500 meter fast observatory. But the problem is, is that fast, although it's an enormous radio telescope, doesn't have the same kind of radar capability that the Arecibo Observatory does. So Arecibo could generate this really powerful radar pulse out into space and then bounce it off of things like asteroids and then be able to scan the surface of those asteroids. And sort of in the exact same week that we got this announcement that Arecibo won't be re rebuilt, we got this cool research of 191 separate asteroids that had been studied by Arecibo. And you can just like see the shape of these asteroids as they came unnervingly close to planet Earth. And now we don't have that capability anymore. There's a like radar capability is being added to another radio observatory, but nothing is going to be like Arecibo for the foreseeable future. So sucks. There's no chance now. Move on. But I can't. So farewell, Arecibo, you will be sorely missed. All right, so those are all the news stories that we had today. Now, if you want to dive deeper into any of the stories that I talk about, you can find links to everything in the show notes down below. You can also get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word. There's no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, 
the Interstellar Adventures, and the Galaxy Wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. Okay, all the news for this week. We'll see you next week.